everybody, good morning, and welcome to all of you to this conference, Gender Matters, Equality and Inclusion Through Care. Um, as, I've just, um, as Alice has just said, I'm Kalyani Lyle. I'm the Scotland Commissioner of the Equality and Human Rights Commission and have the privilege to chair today's meeting and conference. <clears throat> I say privilege because like most of you, I have both a personal and professional interest in the creation of a fairer, caring nation. In developing policy that addresses the stresses and strains, the inequality and exclusion that currently pervades the entire arc that constitutes caring, from childcare to long-term care for disabled and older people. For me, caring felt like I was juggling, always juggling, of feeling anxious, guilty, and being with my mum in her final years of utter despair. There was the struggle too to keep up and abreast of things at work, to be included in conversations and to remain relevant. And I know from the work that the Commission has done on issues of care that mine was not a unique or isolated experience, that caring has significant impact on gender equality. A working together programme was concerned with the changing needs of families, workers and employers in the 21st century. Its focus was on solutions to increase choice, fairness and equality so that the responsibility of childcare did not continue to fall just on women. The findings of our inquiry into the protection and promotion of human rights of older people who require or receive home-based care and support too were instructive. It led to the EHRC working with local authorities to ensure that they incorporate human rights in the ways in which they commission care services and improve complaints procedures. And most recently, our research into pregnancy and maternity at work showed the appalling scale of discrimination and poor treatment of expectant mothers from their employers and or colleagues in the workplace. I'm sure there are also a host of other initiatives and strategic interventions on child and long-term care from many of the organizations present here today. And yet, despite of our efforts, caring undoubtedly continues to be seen as a woman's issue and remains a significant barrier to women's equality. That's what makes this conference organized by Engenda so important. It takes a wider view. It turns the question on its head. Sorry. <clears throat> Using comparative evidence and international models, what we're being asked to consider and discuss is how care policy could be used to achieve gender equality in Scotland, equality and inclusion through care. It's that shift of focus that I think is exciting and could be a catalyst for improving the position of women in Scotland. And we have to thank Stirling University and Engender for this opportunity, who working together have developed the Fairer Caring Nation project. To start the ball rolling, we are pleased to have Shona Robson, Cabinet Secretary for Health, Wellbeing and Sport in the Scottish Government. Thank you, Shona, for agreeing to open the conference. We know that gender equality has emerged as a key area where the Scottish Government wishes to make major and lasting progress. And that commitment is particularly significant because the focus of today's event is the application of inter international lessons to the present policy context in Scotland. Unfortunately, because of other commitments, Shona has to rush off, and so there won't be a question and answer session following her presentation. I'll hand over to Shona. Well, thanks, uh, Kalyani, and uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak this morning on gender equality. So, um, although there's not time for a Q&A, uh, um, I'm sure Jackie Bailey will be happy to do the, the Q&A <laughs> after. Uh, but fun, we were just talking before starting and uh, trying to work out who, who was going first. But in among that, um, you know, we're having a, a chat about some of the, the progress, but also some of the challenges that still remain. And I guess this is an area where, despite 
us disagreeing uh, in Parliament about many things, we absolutely agree uh, that gender equality needs to be at the heart of public policy making. There may be some disagreements around the edges around how best to tackle that, but there's absolutely no disagreement uh, about the principle and the importance of this area. And I guess um, Kalyani was speaking about your personal stakes, and I think we all have, uh, as a daughter of ageing parents, uh, that is a, a responsibility, I guess, that comes with, with being a daughter, whether it should be equally so, uh, for, for those who are sons. Yes, it should, but you know, it feels very much still that daughters take on that caring responsibility in a way that perhaps uh, sons don't. And you know, um, I've experienced over the, the last couple of years that very, very much the, some of uh, that uh, challenge, and there will be more to come as uh, my parents continue to age. But uh, as a mum of a 12-year-old girl, um, I also have a personal stake and aspirations that my daughter is able to fulfil her ambitions, potential aspirations, and is not isn't held back by her gender. Now, you know, she's a very feisty young lady, but I can see already um, some of the challenges. Uh, you know, being a a a twelve-year-old girl growing up in in Scotland brings its own pressures around how to behave, what you know, what you should do, what you should look like, and all of that. That. Are, are difficult for, for young girls growing up in, in our society. I want to touch on a few issues the, this morning um, around starting, obviously focused on gender equality and care policies, but also on the, the wider issues of equality and, and what we can do to reduce the, the gender gap which currently exists. As the, the First Minister has made clear, and I do think having a, a female First Minister in itself sends out a very, very strong message, but also because she uses opportunities to send out a strong message about not um, having barriers to the progression and aspiration of the next generation of, of girls growing up in, in this, this country. And it's important that as women leaders that we always encourage those who uh, are um, potentially uh, wanting to, whether to come into politics or leadership positions, we have a duty to encourage others to do likewise, as some, as some of us were encouraged by women that we came across in our early days of, of politics. We are making progress in a number of areas. One of the areas we were taking action is around the, the care agenda. Uh, and I'm sure we all agree that carers and young carers are absolutely fundamental to our society. They provide vital care and support, often in very challenging circumstances. And of course, throughout their working years, as I touched on earlier on, women are more likely to be carers than men. And that's particularly true for the 35 to 44 age group, where women uh, may be taking more responsibility for having school age or preschool children. And many carers pursue paid work alongside their caring role, either um, employed or, or on a self-employed basis. And a large proportion of women and men are leaving employment in order to provide care, but continuing in employment can be important for current income and longer-term finances due to the impact on pension contributions, for example, of stopping work. So we do recognise that juggling caring responsibilities while striving to achieve personal outcomes, such as returning or remaining in work, can be very, very challenging for unpaid carers. And where carers say that there's been an impact on their employment, a large proportion of women, of women more than men, are affected. Um, the Scottish Government is pursuing a range of policy approaches in, in, to, to try and improve the, the position in this area. The Carer Positive Employer Scheme, for example, in partnership with Carer Scotland and other key stakeholders in um, the different sectors, was launched in June of last year. And the scheme encourages employers to be more carer friendly and supports carers to return to and remain in work. And feedback has been very encouraging. Employers recognise that supporting carers also has a benefit to them in being able to keep experienced staff, saving on recruitment, costs and also 
creating a better morale and productivity. Um, in July this year, there was a total of 28 organisations that had been assessed as being carer positive, and a further 27 have expressed an, an interest or have pledged to participate in the scheme. And that covers public voluntary and third sector organisation as well as some big employers such as Centrica and the Weekly Group. The number of employees in awarded organisations is currently around 86,000, but there's more to be done, and we, particularly in the, the private sector employers, so we need to work on that. We've also <coughs> introduced the, the Care of Scotland Bill to uh, Parliament um, in March this year, and the bill is dovetailing with policies like self-directed support, the Children and Young People's Act and the Public Bodies Joint Working Act to really to provide a better, uh, better support to carers on a more consistent basis so that they can continue in their caring role uh, with better support. It uh, extends the rights of carers in law and also contributes towards um, the ambition of improving the health of Scotland's population, including carers. It's going to widen access to support through the introduction of adult carer support plan and young carer statements, and uh, expects local authorities to work with carers to identify the outcomes that they wish to achieve, which may include outcomes related to finding a job or remaining in employment. Um, the bill also will play a part in promoting a preventative approach across the country. There's, without a doubt, no single policy or initiative that can bring about the, the kind of change required so that carers are supported in such a way. It's about bringing all of these different things together. There's not one single uh, magic bullet, but legislation, I believe, has a role to play, and that's why the, the bill is very important. And carers' organisations have been very very much on the, the, the front foot in making improvements to that bill and Jamie Hepburn as the lead minister has been listening to those representations. But of course the provision of care isn't restricted to unpaid carers. Um, of course many <coughs> um, pay, uh, carers are paid and uh, without which um, you know, our, uh, our health and care services would struggle immensely uh, within our local communities without the, those paid carers who work for local authorities, work for private and voluntary organisations. But of course, attracting and retaining uh, those staff is very, very challenging. Not just about pay, pay is important, but also about other uh, conditions and about the perception of care as a, a career. Uh, we have a challenge, I think, in this country that care is still not seen as an attractive career prospect. Uh, I think the whole integration of health and social care provides opportunities for career progression in and out of different sectors and to provide clear pathways to perhaps towards uh, qualification and regulated profession uh, if that's what the person wants to do. Um, we're working on that and there are some really good examples of people coming in through uh, care employment and then being supported to go through to qualification and in some cases to the regulated professions. We uh, <coughs> very much support the living wage and, and recognise the difference that that can make and addressing low pay through the living wage has been a, an explicit objective uh, for us and for public sector pay policy since 2011. And of course, that's why we've taken direct action to raise minimum rates of pay for those parts of the public sector under our direct responsibility. Uh, but we also have encouraged other employers to follow by committing to pay the living wage. And of course, we have the living wage accreditation system. Uh, we're also working with the care sector. So we've provided um, resources for uh, improving the paying conditions within the care home sector and we're working with uh, the sector and COSLA around the care at home sector. We're very much determined to improve the not just the paying conditions of the care sector but also the perception of uh, what the career opportunities are within that sector. We've also looked at, um, and Rosanna Cunningham has been leading on this around fair work practices as part of the procurement process. The guidance published earlier this month makes clear 
that uh, the Scottish Government sees the payment of the living wage to be a, a significant indicator of an employer's commitment to fair work practices, and it is one of the, the clearest ways an employer can demonstrate that it takes pos a positive approach to its uh, workforce. But it is not the only measure being tackled. The guidance also addresses employment practices more widely, for example, around exploitative practices such as zero hours uh, contracts. Uh, and that is an important uh, message to, to send out um, as well, given that so many women are affected by that type of, of contract. Uh, Callie Annie mentioned uh, childcare earlier on, and it is absolutely important, uh, important that we can attract and retain uh, the right people to the, the, the social care profession uh, to ensure that our most vulnerable members of society are properly cared for, including children. And this will ensure that our children get the best possible start in life through the care that they receive. And we recognise the key role played by early learning and childcare in children's and families' lives. Um, we have invested a, a, a lot of resource over two years to increase the funded uh, entitlement uh, to 600 hours of early learning and childcare for all three- and four-year-olds, and of course that extended to 15 per cent of uh, two-year-olds who are the, the most uh, vulnerable. But we know that high-quality early learning and childcare has major benefits for all children, but particularly for those children from the most uh, deprived communities, and it has an important role to narrowing attainment and the inequality gap. So it's a win-win all round. And that's why uh, we want to see the expansion uh, of uh, childcare. I think recent, recent uh, research indicates that of those mothers who choose to stay at home after the birth of their baby, 59% of them did so because of the high cost of early learning and childcare. And there's also evidence that fathers take a more active role in the care of their children in households where mothers work. And this supports a better sharing of family and financial responsibilities. Um, so we are very much focused on how we can go further still in giving every child a, a better start in life. And that's why in the coming years we're going our ambition is to double the number of hours of early learning and childcare by offering uh, 1,140 hours per year of flexible early learning and childcare for three and four year olds and those two year olds who are currently eligible for the 600 hours of provision. The availability of early learning and childcare is of course important, particularly to women in balancing their work and family lives. However, increasing the opportunities for flexible working has got to be a priority for us. The legal powers governing flexible working are reserved to Westminster, but of course the Scottish Government has an important role to play in helping parents and carers manage the, the responsibilities of work and caring. And we recognise that family friendly and flexible working is crucial to allowing families to balance commitments at home and at work. And that's why we're providing funding and are committed a committed member of the Family Friendly Working Scotland Partnership, which uh, aims to support organisations and individuals alike. And some of the activities being supported are delivering the, the second Scottish Top for Working Families Awards, promoting a flexible working strapline uh, called Happy to Top Flexible Working, which employers can use on job adverts, creating a network of champions to help us achieve our aims and de uh, delivering a series of employers' events to help promote the benefits of flexible working uh, to organisations. And we're pleased to see that the UK government also recognises the importance of that, and as um, shown through the introduction of the shared parental leave, that's a, a welcome uh, thing, and uh, uh, we we want to to see more of that uh, type of uh, of initiative. I just want to say a word as well about the the, the wider um, issue of equality, because all of this sits really within you know a, a kind of wider framework. It isn't just a question about getting more women into employment. It's about high quality jobs and giving proper recognition to the work that women do. It's not just about encouraging girls into traditional male dominated sectors, although that is important, but it's about how they're supported to thrive and grow in their careers once 
there, there. And it's not just about having the right legislative framework to combat discrimination, although that's important, but it's also about ensuring that women can access justice and to be able to challenge discrimination when they experience it. And in order to make meaningful progress, we need to be taking action on all of these fronts and uh, more. In Scotland, the gap between male and female employment rates is, is at a record low, and uh, it's 72 per cent, compared uh, quite favourably to the UK female employment rate of 68.5 per cent. However, nobody is complacent, and women are still more likely than men to be working part-time and are more likely to be economically inactive, so there is still much more uh, to do. And as a result of continued occupational segregation, women and men continue to be channelled into particular sectors and industries, depriving those sectors from accessing the full wealth of experience and talent which is out there among both genders. The combination of these different factors means that despite record high female employment rates, we continue to see a real and persistent gender pay gap between men and women. So in order to, to drive um, change and to close that, that gap and truly maximise opportunities uh, for women in Scotland, we have to take action on all of these fronts. Because women do have the right to have their work valued. They have the right not to be discriminated against because they, of their gender or because they're mothers or carers. And we as a government have a responsibility to ensure that those rights are uh, upheld. Um, I hope that uh, we have given you, through the programme for govern government as well, a sense of our continued and absolute commitment to tackling inequality uh, and, as part of that, to realising women's equality. We have we've committed to extending the duty on public authorities to public, publish gender pay gap information and statements on equal pay, including occupational segregation. And these duties uh, currently apply to authorities listed in the Equality Act, which have more than 150 employees, but we're going to lower that threshold so that the duty applies to listed authorities with more than 20 employees. And we'll also continue to grow our Partnership for Change, encouraging more organisations and businesses to sign up to the commitment to work towards 50-50 gender balance on their boards by 2020. We were speaking to Jackie earlier on about some of the challenges around that. Progress is being made. I mean, we have uh, 153 organisations and businesses signed up, including over 90% of public bodies. But um, there's absolutely more that can be done. And we're trying to Trying to uh, encourage people to come forward uh, is, is challenging. I suppose it's a bit of a vicious circle. If women don't see women in uh, those positions, um, then they, they get the message it's not for them. So we absolutely need to increase the visibility of women within uh, public life. Progress has been made. Um, uh, certainly, as a minister, I've seen progress over my lifetime as a, a minister and the appointment opportunities and choices coming to me has improved. However, I, it's fair to say that we still have, um, we have problems with the lack of diversity of, of candidates coming through and we have to think about new ways of broadening um, that, uh, those opportunities. The, the Scottish Government's public appointments team and the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in tandem with the Partnership for Change are driving forward improvements within regulated public appointments, but um, you know, more has to be done and we need a quicker pace uh, on that so that we begin to see more visibility, not, not just um, among women, although we know that more women, having more women breaks the barriers for others who are underrepresented in society, uh, but we absolutely need to see uh, more diversity, and that will be good for our public bodies to have that diversity within uh, their, their leaderships. Um, we are also working with the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission to consider how we can challenge pregnancy and maternity discrimination after a recent report showed that as many as 54,000 new mothers are being forced out of their jobs in the UK every year. We should be shocked and concerned about that. It's simply unacceptable and we're determined to absolutely challenge that discrimination in any way that, that we can. 
and it's important that we continue to work to address these challenges, that we continue to work with strategic partners to deliver a more inclusive workforce, that we support the Women in Enterprise framework to support and encourage more women to start up their own businesses, that we invest in accessible and affordable early learning and childcare, that we continue to promote fair work practices uh, through uh, all of our the uh, activities of, of government, that we take action on equal pay, and that we pursue uh, the, the devolution of powers uh, from the UK government to allow us to legislate, uh, for example, on gender balance on boards, although in the meantime we continue to pursue this through uh, the 50-50 campaign by 2020. So just to, to end by, I guess, where I started, and you know, to, to say to you this isn't just a, a policy objective uh, for me. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's political, but it's also personal. Um, for uh, as long as I can remember in my political life, the issue of, of gender equality has been hugely important. Uh, I've seen a big change in politics of women coming through and, and not just coming through, but making it into leadership positions in politics. I mean, I think back in my lifetime, that was quite a rare thing. And, uh, you know, women were treated in a, um, well, uh, and perhaps still are, but maybe less, less visibly so, but were treated as a, a, a kind of rarity and, and strange uh, thing around political circles by, by men from all walks of life. Now we see women in the mainstream in politics, but we're absolutely not there yet. We need to continue with that momentum. We need to encourage young women to see uh, polit politics and leadership roles within society as being for them. And you know, as just to end with my favourite expression of you, you can't be what you can't see, uh, that sums it up for me. We have to see women, whether that's in the boardrooms of public bodies, whether it's around uh, the, the, the boardrooms of, our, uh, of businesses, um, whether that's in politics or whether it's in other leadership roles uh, within Scotland, we have to see women in those because that in itself sends out the strongest message that that is where women should be and must be. Thank you very much. And sorry I can't stay. I've got meetings in Edinburgh. I hope the day goes well and we'll certainly uh, catch up. If there are any questions, just get, get them and send them in and we'll get a, a response thank back. So thank, thank you very much. Not at all. The day goes well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shona. Um, and I am sorry you're not going to be here, but we will, I'm sure there will be questions that we will then send on to you. But it, it set out a really good uh, kind of context for the rest of the day. There's a whole slew of policy um, objectives and things that the Scottish Government are doing. And, and also you raised the issue around devolved powers and reserved and so on. Those, those are things that we will be picking up on later. So thank you very much. Thank you. Is that what I do too? Ah. Um, I finish with. Okay, the next bit um, um, uh, we get into the meat of why we're here, and so I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Kirstin Rummery from Stirling University. Professor Rummery will explain the Fairer Caring Nations project and go on to present the childcare strand of the research. Professor Rummery led the work on this project. Her biography, which you have in your pack, details her extensive research experience in the field of gender and feminist studies. So if I could hand over to you. And thank you all. I know some of you are going to leave kind of halfway through and, and be replaced by people who are interested in long-term care. So I will be particularly thankful for those of you who are going to stay and actually learn across the issues around childcare and long-term care. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for Shona setting out very nicely, nicely for us some of the, the issues that the Scottish Government are looking at. Um, as Kalyani said, we will, I will pick up some of those issues through the strands of my talk, both on childcare and on long-term care, but I will also challenge some of the kind of normative values behind the, the choice of priorities um, in some of those things, and, and I'm sure uh, Jackie and Alison will as well. Because I think what we've all, I've met a lot of you before and, and um, in different circumstances, both in the run-up to the referendum on independence and afterwards. Um, and I think what we all share, if you're here in the room, you share an interest in gender equality. 
Um, and I've shared that interest passionately since I was chucked out of um, church um, very young age for asking why there weren't any women uh, ministers involved. Um, and that has, that caused, that's run all the way through the research that I've done all of my life. There's been two main strands of that research. One is around kind of disability rights and long-term care, etc. And the other one has been around kind of health and social care policies and gender equality and those. And this was a lovely, fantastic opportunity to kind of bring those two strands together. I know I'm not the only person who thinks that childcare and long-term care have lessons to learn from each other. And I know I'm not the only person who thinks both of those policy areas are very, very important for gender equality. But it does remain the case that those two areas are very significantly kind of different, both within the Scottish context, within the UK context, and also within the international context that I'm going to be drawing on. So there's lots of di kind of different things I want to kind of try and get out of this day. Um, the first thing I will say is I am not going to give you a lot of things around comparative social policy and comparative evidence will give you details of, oh, well, we all need to be like Finland and we all need to be like uh, Norway, or if we're um, conservatives, we all need to be like Germany or we all need to be like France or America. That's not what this is about. You can only transport, transport policies from another context into your own context if you actually understand not so much how the policies work in individual uh, cases, but the sort of values and systems that underpin them. So you can then look and see, do we have those values and those systems underpinning our system here? So whilst, for example, Shona and Jackie might agree on gender equality being important, and it should be at the heart of policies, the Labour Party and the SNP will probably disagree quite radically on how you get to gender equality. And I think within Scotland, we need to kind of find out how we get to gender equality, what we can transport from abroad around values, context, what kinds of institutions do you need, what kind of legislative framework can you meet, need, do you need, what could we bring into Scotland um, what do we need to change, rather than looking at, for example, a whole-scale import of a finished daycare system, which then everybody throws up their arms and goes, well, of course we can't do that, we can't afford it, we don't train our teachers the same way as the Finns do, we don't even speak Finnish, which is important, actually, in terms of comparative evidence. So what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about why I've chosen to focus on childcare, apart from it's kind of quite obvious. Childcare, uh, as all of you know, is one of, and, and Shona pointed out, is one of the barriers to women's um, labour market participation. But it's also important for other reasons. And some of the things that we looked at were around the investment in early learning in terms of how it gets rid of kind of income and educational attainment inequalities over the life course. Um, we also looked at the importance of father's involvement within childcare and the interplay between the provision of childcare, the type of childcare that's provided and parental leave. Shona talked very movingly there about, you know, we need more women in visible positions of power, but my counteraction to that is, well, we need more men caring as well. This actually has to be a two-way process, uh, not just across genders. We also talked there a little bit about the involvement of the community, the family, the state, and employers who are often left out of this equation, particularly within uh, the UK and the Scottish context, which is interesting because we do actually have a broad uh, approach to welfare that actually imp in includes business. We all do want economic uh, growth and sustainability, even those of us on, on the left side of the political spectrum do accept the need for economic growth in terms of prosperity, etc. Uh, we might disagree on how neoliberal we want to be about that, but Scotland wants to be a thriving economic performer. Childcare plays a very, very important role in that, but it's not just down to women, and it's not just down to the state, and it's not just down to individual families. It can't be. It has to be a partnership approach. And I think that is what I will conclude with, and I'll sort of lead you through the evidence that says that that um, we actually need to develop a partnership approach towards the provision of childcare. Instead of looking at the individual elements of one particular childcare uh, context, I'm going to take a step back and a kind of analytical step back and say, what are the features of a childcare system that is 
successful in achieving gender equality, because that was our overarching aim for this kind of project. How do these systems get to gender equality? What is it about them that works in terms of getting uh, women into positions of power? And gender equality, uh, just a brief thing, it'll, it'll be in the book that uh, is advertised in your packs. Um, we measured on an international scale using the Gender Equality Index, which measures access to resource, access to leisure, access to power, and access to loads of kinds of things throughout society. So it's not just about income equality, it's, it's measuring a broad sector of things. I'm going to be looking at childcare in conjunction with other policies, because what we very, very quickly learned, particularly in childcare, but also when we come to the long-term care bit, is that you can't consider childcare in isolation. Certainly in terms of you need to be looking at things like flexible leave and you need to be looking at parental leave and other kinds of policies as well. And then I'm going to end with, uh, you know, what could Scotland do? Because that's my opportunity to throw it over to kind of panel members like Maggie and Jackie, but then also to open it up to you um, looking at your experiences. So... What makes a better childcare system? In other words, what do all of the countries that we've looked at um, have in common that we don't have? The first one is that they have very much focused on the supply side. In other words, they've, they've focused on investing in the infrastructure of nurseries and childcare providers, rather than focusing on, for example, uh, tax credits through the, the demand side that enable people to pay for childcare within an open market system. Um, and that is, as, as we know, in contrast to the main, body, main thrust of UK policy so far, although there has been a focus on the supply side, the main focus has been on stimulating um, the, the, the demand side and enabling working parents to have systems of, of supporting the way in which they paid for childcare. And I've always thought, I can say this because the, the, there aren't any Tories in the room as far as I know, I've always thought the Tories did this because they all had nannies. So they built this on the predication of how do we get low-paid parents to pay, be able to pay for nannies? And that isn't really <laughs> the best childcare system that you can envisage. In fact, if you look internationally, in-home daycare probably has the worst outcomes in terms of if you're trying to look at achieving educational attainment and, and, and tackling those kinds of things. Um, so that does come back to what is it that childcare systems are actually trying to achieve. And this will be, I think, if, if we can get cross-party consensus and cross-sector consensus on, yes, childcare is important, gender is equality is important, that's actually quite easy, but it needs to be stated. It does really, really need to be stated. Where the interesting thing is, and this is where kind of the politicians come in, is they need to have arguments and present us as the electorate with credible evidence on what the best way to get there is. Because if I think, as a working mother, as an academic, as a, as a voting citizen in Scotland, particularly come the Holyrood elections, I'm going to be asking all of those political parties, and I ask all of you too as well, what are you going to do about gender equality and childcare? What are your specific plans? What's your vision? Do I believe in that vision? Do I sign up to that vision? And hopefully you'll come away with a sense of where that vision has come from in terms of where we might position ourselves on the international stage. This is where Jackie and I disagreed, <laughs> because one of the first things that I found out when I started doing this research was that what put countries ahead of us was the it's gender equality was embedded into the constitutions of those countries. They had a legal framework that gave, that put gender equality at the heart of it. Now, we can do that in Scotland, and we already do within a certain legislative framework. But the only way to consistently have that is if, is, is if you actually control the whole of the legal framework for your country. So I kind of said, for that reason alone, I think we should go pro-independence. And I think Jackie very much disagreed with me on that one. And so did the Scottish electorate. So that's fair enough. We don't have the legal framework at the moment to embed gender equality into our constitution as an independent nation. That doesn't mean it can't have a much higher prominence within the legislative framework within, we are, within which we are already operating. And hopefully, if I don't run out of time, I'll talk a little bit about the Quebec experience of doing that under a devolved federal type system so that we could do it within Scotland while remaining in the UK within the legislative framework that we already have. The third thing is that 
Little alarm bells went off for me when Shona said, vulnerable children, we're going to be focusing our childcare provision on vulnerable children. To a certain extent, it depends what you want to achieve to your childcare system. If you want to tackle social inequalities, then yes, you do target things on vulnerable sectors of the, po of the population. But if you want to get women into work, if you want to tackle poverty and inequality more generally, and if you want to attack, if you want to raise educational attainment for everyone rather than just bringing kind of very poor, vulnerable children up to the standards that um, middle class, wealthy children already have, which I think we should be a bit more ambitious than that for Scotland. We should be trying to raise everybody. Then it has to be universal coverage. It cannot be targeted coverage because targeted coverage becomes stigmatized, it's not taken up, and it is the first thing that is cut whenever any kind of budgets or austerity begin to be focused on. Whereas universal coverage creates social cohesion. It appeals across the classes, which is why it's electorally um, a good thing to have no matter what political party you are. No, no middle class family, and we're all trying to get middle class families to vote whatever way we want them to vote. Uh, no middle class family is going to say no, universal childcare, that's a really bad thing free bits of childcare for my children. No, I'm, that, that, that makes my life kind of personally easier. I'm, I'm going to vote against that. But at the same time, that brings particularly vulnerable children into the fold and it addresses, and we do know from our own evidence from Sure Start and, and places like that, but also internationally, that this really does um, address some of the issues around vulnerable and excluded children extremely well, but it has to be universal, not targeted. But then we have to accept that if it is targeted, it's not going to address inequalities quite as effectively as it would be. In other words, those children who are already benefiting from a good background and a safe environment coming into primary school, we know that by age five, pretty much their destination when they leave school is decided. And whatever we do within universal access to education doesn't change that radically. And then beyond post-16, and particularly beyond post-18, get, the gap gets even wider, um, which is why I have issues around no fees for university education, but that's a completely different issue. If we look at internationally at the comparison of Flanders and Sweden, both have very, very high coverage rates, both invested in the infrastructure, which is exactly what you're supposed to do, but... If you invest on the supply side, in other words, if you invest on the, on the infrastructure rather than targeting it, which is what Sweden does, it's much more beneficial for those on the lower income scale in terms of where they end up than if you just, if you just target and try and, and get the demand side going. Going back to uh, legal obligations, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark and Estonia all have legal obligations to provide childcare. In other words, there is a social right to a resource actually embedded in the legislation. Now, Scotland does have some of the legal uh, levers to do that, and it could in future, with increasing devolved powers, get some of the levers to do that. It's also had some of the levers to do that since devolution in 1999 and hasn't. So that's another question about you know, how committed we are, both as, a, as a, a political system, but also as a nation, in terms of, are we really taking this? There's an awful lot we could have done with what we've already got and haven't done. So that's a difficult question. Um, you need to think about geography. One of the, one of the case studies I was looking at uh, does have a dispersed kind of urban, rural, and, but only one of them. They're all very centralised kind of urban-based societies. Denmark, in particular, is quite small, um, similar, similar population, but it's easy to concentrate supply around um, cities and around urban centres. It's, it's a completely different question when you're talking about the highlands and islands and provision. You cannot have you know, a daycare centre in Inverness, which is lovely, but if people have to travel for six hours to get to it and they don't even work in Inverness, it's absolutely totally useless. Um, so you'd need to have, particularly within Scotland, a much more flexible approach to what you consider to be investing in the supply. Um, there is a danger in demand, um, particularly if at the, and at the moment we are focusing quite a lot on, on the demand side provision, is that if you rely on the private sector, 
you are very, very vulnerable to the private sector pulling out as soon as things don't look particularly rosy in the garden. This has happened in particular around Australia, which also shares our problem with kind of, you know, dispersed populations and, and how you get childcare, particularly in very uh, uh, distant geographic centres. We do know that marketisation per se, unless it's strongly regulated by the government, leads to lower wages, leads to kind of uh, potentially lower quality provision as well. So we need to keep an eye on that. I'm not saying that marketisation is bad, and I will come to uh, the, the, what elements, how are in the different models about marketisation. But it does need strong regulation, particularly in childcare and in the long-term care sector, so that you don't drive wages down and drive things by how can we provide things cheaply. I mean, it's worth remembering at the moment that we, um, and I discovered this at the weekend because my boiler stopped working, <laughs> we, pay our boiler, we pay our plumbers four times the rate that we pay our childcare workers. And that's with, you know, bringing a lot of work in recent years to bring the, the, the salaries of childcare workers up. It used to be far higher, that gap. Does that mean as a society that we value our boilers four times more than we value our children? I'd like to think not. <laughs> But that's what happens when you let the market go in unregulated and decide kind of wages and what we're willing to pay. So, um, and I think the role of local authorities in the regulation side of things is actually quite key, and it, it is key through all of these models. Uh, whether they've outsourced it, uh, particularly as they have in the Netherlands and Germany, they still retain a very strong regulatory focus, and I think that's a strong role for local authorities to play. But as I said, not on its own. And one of the key important things, and we have not grasped this, and I don't care how excited we all get about the two weeks of paternity leave, that is not nearly enough, um, about maternity and paternity leave. I'm going to talk about Iceland, and everybody's going to run up and down and go, but we can't possibly have that policy here. And I'm going to give you reasons why we could, and why we might think about something as radical as that. Because... It is a partnership between parents and the state and employers, the way in which we think about childcare. At the moment, employers are getting far too easy a ride in the UK and within Scotland. They need to be brought into the fold and they need to see the benefits for them. And the benefits for them are immense, absolutely immense, but they're just not convinced of them. So we need to present them with that evidence carrot and stick approach, um, which is a really important role for the Scottish Parliament, I think, to play. And we need to be asking, again, in the run-up to the Holy Week, because this is about, you know, this is, these are levers that Scotland can exercise. It doesn't have to wait for Westminster to do things like this. We need to think about the motherhood penalty over the life course. There certainly is, and we see it everywhere. I see it in my profession, that people who take time off for childcare responsibilities or long-term care responsibilities who are overwhelmingly, but not exclusively women, I would, I would take Shona up on that, there's a lot of men providing care, particularly in later, um, uh, later life around Alzheimer's and, and older people provide spouse care, um, is that, uh, you know, there's the mummy track. And I see people who come back to work after taking time out in academia, women particularly, either go on the mummy track, which means they, they keep um, kind of, they look after their students and they do all the nice caring things, but they don't publish papers and they don't go to international conferences, so they don't get promoted. Or they do what I did, which is come to work and go, oh, thank God, I've come to work for a rest, I can have a cup of coffee in peace that's actually hot, and um, their, their careers take off. Because in my case, I had a very understanding partner and um, lots of money to pay for childcare. Um, Although we complain about it, academics do get paid quite well, so I do have a lot of resources at my um, disposal. And Sterling is quite good at providing in the infrastructure around childcare. We've got lots of good after-school clubs, um, which are under, underused, actually, which was also a surprise to me. We have to tackle the issue of culture. And this comes up in Germany particularly, the Kinderküche Kirche expectation. There is an inbuilt expectation within Scottish society that care is a woman's job. We absolutely have to tackle that. And it's partly through getting women into public life. Because actually, unless those women, which let's face it, a lot of them have chosen to be childless or to, to outsource their, their, their caring responsibilities, they will have had to make those decisions in order to do that. But we also need to change the culture in the workplace. 
I am fed up of all the women in my department being able to say, well, no, we're finishing at five because I've got to go and pick up so-and-so for... And I know half of the people in that room are fathers. They are leaving too. They never say a damned word. That has to change. Absolutely has to change. Men have to step up and be willing to take caring responsibilities. And if they're offered paternity leave, then we need a carrot and stick approach that means they actually take it and use it. Because the Icelandic approach, which gives, father, uh, gives a shared leave, uh, use it or lose it thing to fathers, so they can get up to six months of the shared leave themselves if they want, and an extra bit that is only theirs, that around 75% of men did take it up. But the interesting thing was two years later, those men were significantly more involved in everyday childcare, in the running kids to school, picking kids up from school, knowing what day PE kits needed to be ready for. That's a big issue in our house. I don't know about your house. And my key thing is if, if the dad knows when the PE kits need to be there, then we're getting somewhere. If only mum knows, and if only mum is running around and then going and doing a full shift at work, and then going home and doing the second and third shift at home, that's not progress, that's just women absolutely exhausting themselves. Okay, progress would be if there was real equal sharing. And of course we need to think about lone parents and we need to think about different family uh, things. And also within Scotland, we have grandparents as a huge resource, which I didn't have. My, my parents live conveniently for them in, in Vienna, so they're not really very hands-on childcare, but they're very good for Christmas. Um, <laughs> So we do need to think about different patterns of expectations within families, and we do need to think about using the community um, and as a resource. There's a, there's a wealth of experience in the community around childcare, etc., and that needs to be valued. So grandparental leave, for example, is used within, or just, just general caring leave that you can use for, it, uh, for pets as well, uh, in terms of, of, of children, because all... All my child-free friends who have dogs go, well, why can't I have time off when I have to take Timmy to the vet? And I go, it's not quite the same. But it is an acknowledgement that people have responsibilities and that the work they're doing for that community, for their families, is just as important as the paid work that they're doing in the labour market in terms of building a thriving kind of society that we want to live in in Scotland. We need to address, as Shona touched on this, the pay and status of providers. We really need childcare to stop being the low-paid, low-skilled end of the economy. We need to, and we need to value it because it's women's work. So I'll just talk briefly now about the different models and then get on to the final bit because I'm starting to run out of time. Now, we have the universal model, and this is the bit where Scotland goes, why don't we look more like the Nordic countries? Um, but we don't want to have to pay Nordic levels of taxation, which is consistent. We're still doing um, surveys over this. And, and you know, what do you want Devolved Scotland to look like? Well, we want it to look like Denmark, but we don't want to pay 75% in taxes. Um, you can get elements of the universal model without those levels of taxation, but I would argue that you actually therefore have to move towards a more partnership model. And this is where we see um, things in Germany and the Netherlands working around an idea that it's not just the state that provides services and citizens pay the taxes and get their services. I would really like there to be that kind of state, um, but you know that's, that was 200 years in the making. We're not in that position. We need to be politically realistic about what we can achieve and also what society actually wants in Scotland. I might want that and I might be really, you know, I'm a social policy person. We're all very social democratic, but I think the evidence shows that wider Scottish society isn't actually prepared, prepared for that level of state intervention in their lives is what they would see it as. So more of a partnership model that we see in Germany and the Netherlands. And using the devolved powers that we already have and campaigning for further devolved powers much more effectively, which is what happened in the Quebec model, where they were the only other um, devolved uh, unit recently to vote against independence, um, which uh, amused lots of people when they came over to Scotland. But in the process of that voting against, in fact, it was much narrower than us. It was 49%, you know, to 50%. So there was a very strong feeling for independence, but not quite enough to legislatively push it. But a 45% is, and I think quite a lot of the, the people who voted against independence wanted further powers to be devolved. They just wanted to do that within, while remaining in the UK. And the, the research that we're doing in the Constitutional Centre backs that up, that, that people want 
further powers along the Smith Commission, but even further than the Smith Commission went on, on certain issues, so that Scotland can devise its own social policies to meet its own needs. Um, so there is a kind of model for doing that within Quebec, and that is to make the argument across the political spectrum. So investment in early years provision and investment in effectively free childcare in Quebec was argued for because of economic interests, that Quebec was behind the rest of the country economically. We can't argue that in Scotland, <laughs> we're doing quite well economically. But it was about pushing forward economic development. But it was also about pushing forward gender equality, women's participation in the labour market, men's participation in the home, and it was particularly about pushing forward educational attainment. It was building on that pedagogical evidence that high quality early years provision is the key. And I'd be, I'm doing myself out of a job in this by saying that there's been an awful lot of focus on the, the role of higher education at achieving equality, but actually by then it's too late. Once people get into higher education, those structural embedded inequalities are there already. You can't undo them. You have to start much, much earlier. So we would have to, in Scotland, make difficult decisions about shifting funding and priorities from, for example, higher education to early years, um, etc. And I shouldn't say that because all my colleagues will turn around going, you're doing yourself out of a job. Obviously, social policy should continue to be invested in. There are other areas of higher education <laughs> that could go. But you see what I mean? There, there is kind of where money goes in the system reflects a government's priorities. Um, it doesn't really matter how much money there is. It's how it gets divided up that gives us the key. And if we are really, really serious about early years, then we will put funding and resources into it. Um, we have to work in terms of looking at what works for whom and why. So if you are trying to construct a childcare system, is it about women's equality and um, is it about getting women into work? Because that's a different objective to trying to get to address early years attainment. You can construct things that will try and address both of those, but you might have to make difficult choices between them. Um, if you're trying to get a system that gets fathers more involved in their children, if you're trying to get a system that has the community more involved, that kind of, and employers more involved, you're going to structure a system differently than if you are trying to construct a system that is universally accessible, low cost, high quality, like the Scandinavian nations. So before we all sort of think about, oh, we've got to invest so much in childcare, we've got to have so many childcare places, we really need to start taking really difficult value-based questions about what it is we are trying to achieve, and it might not be the same thing. And we all assume that we're trying to achieve the same things, and perhaps when we get behind it, we're not. Some things are more important than others. Um, and I, I think it's very, very important when I talk here about childcare and later on about long-term care, to not look at the nitty-gritty of the individual context because that would need to be worked out within a Scottish context anyway. It's to look at the features of those models and the values of those models. So I would say that the, the demand side is faltering. It's not actually achieving what it needs to achieve within the UK. There's been a focus on tax credits have been withdrawn anyway for the lowest income families um, and and that's been a huge issue. There's not been enough of a focus on supply within the UK. This is starting to be addressed within the Scottish context, but I, it's still, I would say, not enough in terms of addressing that. Not enough focus has been given to the values by which I mean, what is it we're trying to achieve? We seem to think that we can achieve everything through this, and we can't. We have to focus our attention on what the most important policy objectives are. And those will differ. I would be very surprised if Jackie would be arguing for the same case and the same structure as Shona would be in this, because then what's the point of having two political parties? We may as well just all amalgamate. So, and similarly, there's a strong business case for this in terms of, uh, of, of economic, um, which we haven't got a, a conservative here, but you know, Ruth would argue that. There is a strong business case for investment in childcare. But if you're, if you're investing in childcare for business reasons, you will invest in a different kind of structure than you will if you're investing in it for educational purposes or for gender equality purposes. So you need to think about which elements you want to incorporate into your system in terms of you know, what it is you're trying to achieve. You do need a carrot and stick approach. We do know that penalties don't work. We've tried parental leave. 
on a kind of, oh, you can have it, but don't worry too much about it, doesn't work. You absolutely have to make, hit people in their pockets um, and make them make decisions that are good for them and society. <laughs> um, and, and in a sense, that does involve a bit of state manipulation in, into private lives. And I'm just going to close up now. This is the, the thing that you always get shown, which is why we can't have an Icelandic system, okay? Why we can't do this is because Iceland invests, what is it, 1.7% of its GDP in childcare, and we invest under 1% of our GDP in childcare. That's the wrong end of the story. That really, really is. I think what we need to be looking at is what we can do, not what we can't do. I think we need to address the limitations that we're focusing on, and this is the bit where I start to open it up to you because I'd, I'm very interested to hear Maggie and, and Jackie's take on this and then all of your takes on this. But I think we are lacking some really important policy levers in the Scottish Parliament to tackle some of this, and I can't see a particularly good reason why we don't have them or why we wouldn't campaign to have some of those policy levers. Um, we do know that shifting energies to, tack, to, to, to focus on the supply side does involve an awful lot of work. It involves a lot of investment that we are not going to see a payback for probably for about five to ten years. We will see that payback, but that is longer than the parliamentary cycle. That is longer than any political party reasonably can sign up to because they are signing up to objectives that their competitors are going to see the benefits of in ten years' time. Also very, very difficult for us, particularly if you're asking elderly parts of the population, I, I want you know, a bit of your taxation money to invest in childcare that we're going to see the benefits of in 10 years' time, by which point you'll be retired and not really care. It's not going to directly benefit you. We're talking about investment for future generations, and that is really difficult, socially and politically. I think we could already provide more, in, more incentives and support for low-income parents. We've got universal credit coming. We've got levers, tax levers, that we could use to do this within the Scottish Parliament. Um, we've had some of these tax levers already and we're very unwilling to use them, certainly in terms of raising tax. It's politically... I wouldn't do it if I was a politician because I'd get voted out. Nobody's going to get voted back in if they've raised income tax for certain bits of, of society, so I really don't blame them. But at the same time, that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to use the powers that we've already got, be brave enough to do that if we really, really care about this. Don't underestimate the importance of universalism. It creates social cohesion. It's politically the right thing to do in terms of everybody can sign up to it. And we need everybody to sign up to agreeing that gender equality and care and childcare is a good thing to go for because we actually need most people to sign up to working towards it, whether it's through paying for it through their pay packet or providing it or, or changing the way in which they work. That's going to be quite fundamentally difficult, changing cultural aspirations. So it, the benefits have to be seen to be universal, I would say. Use the tax base, use the powers that we've got to raise revenue. Uh, we don't raise local authority taxes. I mean, there's a, don't even get me started on that as a social policy thing. Basically, there's a huge bit we need to do that we need to tackle. Um, and the other thing is, early years, theoretically, is education. I've got one minute left, so I'll use it to say this. We've had control over education policy since 1701, effectively. Certainly since the devolution in 1999. And we have not done it. We know, we, every single person in this room knows why we have to do it and knows that it's important. But we still, as a society and as a political economy, have not done it. So perhaps we need to look at that. Why? What is the huge barrier to that? Why haven't we used the powers we've already got before we start whinging about, well, we haven't got any independence, so we can't do anything. We haven't got further devolved powers, so we can't do anything. Why haven't we done what? If Scotland, when I came to, I moved to Scotland, everybody told me Scotland is this wonderful social democratic paradise compared to the rest of the UK. And in certain respects, it is. In certain respects, it's got a much more inclusive style of governance. I can go down and talk to people like Jackie with 
evident, research evidence and the Scottish Government and the opposition and parties etc., do take us seriously. They want to know what's going on, which is more than can be said for Westminster. But at the same time, if you look at the outcomes, if you look at what people have actually done since devolution, it really isn't that progressive or dynamic, certainly not as it could be. If we were and if we're going to be serious about gender equality, serious about care policy, policy, we have to get dynamic and we have to start taking some risks. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.